get set up here. Thank you very much, Susan. That was very nice. Um, I recently read uh, one of the Winnie the Pooh poems to my son, who responded with, with what I thought was a startling comment at the time. He said, Agu, Agu. So I think we've got a little ways to go before we get into uh, his understanding <coughs> some of uh, the poems. I'd just like to make a few remarks in introducing some of the uh, poetry that we're going to read today. And at the risk of offending some of you possibly and some of your teachers, uh, make a few comments concerning how poetry has been taught, or at least what I've experienced and how poetry has been taught in the schools. If it <clears throat> applies, please understand that this comes from someone who has had a love affair with the rhyming word since I was very small. <clears throat> I enjoy trying to get other people to appreciate this rather unique art form. I think many students have been turned off by an analytical approach to poetry. By this I mean something along the lines of the following. Class, now pay attention. Today, lose your microphone. Today we will discuss the works of Browning. Now, that's a lead-in that's pretty much designed to turn off all but the most ardent student. Study the works is a phrase which conjures up visions of walking about this massive immutable structure with a tape measure and a survey glass to determine the method of construction, materials needed, number of laborers, length of time for construction. Works is an imposing word and imposes on the student the idea that this stuff is really boring. And quite frankly, a lot of it is. But from my perspective, a lot of it is really exciting and interesting. You in the second row, pay attention. We're going to have a spot quiz following this. Ah, <laughs> uh, did you once see Shelley Plain? And did he stop and speak to you? And did you speak to him again? How strange it seems and new. Anybody have any idea what that means? I certainly don't. Who is Shelley? Is he a friend of Browning's? Does it seem strange to you? Did the two people speak? What did they have for lunch? What is the technical rhyme that the author is putting to use here? I haven't the foggiest idea, nor should anybody at that point. You have to read the entire poem. You have to understand something of the nature of the culture, of the time period that that particular work comes from. Without that understanding, a lot of what is described as classics in both poetry and literature really is befuddling to most of us. You get into Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, for example, and you find that Rodrian Romanovich Rushkolnikov, who is one of my favorite names from literature, is really a very, very sick boy. And why Dostoevsky spent the better part of 700 pages describing this person and the sickness sometimes is a little bit difficult to comprehend. It doesn't get any easier to comprehend after you reread him after 20 years. What I'd like to try and do today is convey, convey to you the feeling of poems, the sense of the art form, the creativity of word usage, Knowing with some precision just what the author is saying is not as important as understanding that the author has been able to put sometimes very commonplace things into an unusual perspective. Understanding that perspective takes years. And as you grow and gain experience, what you thought something meant when you were 15 or 16 or 17 has changed considerably by the time you're 25 and changes still further when you reach the age of 40 which, barring some massive offense by you people against your parents, you probably will get to that point someday. So when you hear the words, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach. When feeling out of sight for the ends of being an ideal grace. All you really need to know about that was that Liz Browning was smitten. This young lady was simply head over heels in love. And as you will discover, the nature of love changes as you grow. Love at 16 is surely different than love at 30. Quick word on the classics. Most of them 
very difficult for us to understand because of the changes of the time and culture have made in our respective civilizations. A fellow named William Brown once wrote a poem entitled On the Countess Dowager of Pembroke. Well, today we aren't sure what a countess is or does, haven't the finest idea what a dowager means, and couldn't find Pembroke if we were given a week. So it is little wonder that this 17th century poet is not part of our common body of 20th century knowledge. Another problem in understanding and appreciating this art form is the subject matter which many poets chose to write about. Love and death occupied the topics of many poets. Romantic images and grief seem to be topics which lend themselves to the imagery and nuance of poetry. But other people's love is not really a spectator sport, and death, particularly for the young, just ain't a whole lot of fun. There's not a lot of laughs in the topic. So it seems to me that poetry is perceived to be either as mushy, do you use that word here? Or dismal. It isn't true, and you'll see that when we get into some of the poems I brought for you today. I consider myself <clears throat> extremely lucky. When I was very small, my father would recite poems to my brother and I. Some were fun, children's poems, and others lent themselves to his deep, rolling voice, which could thrill a small boy. Like many male children, I wanted badly to be able to recite a poem like my daddy could. Now, 35 years later, I still don't feel I'm as good as he is, but then I'm still learning. So as not to stand before you under false pretenses, I want to say for the record that I am not an expert in poetry. I have no degrees in the subject and no deep technical knowledge. So when we get into the question period, I may tell you quite simply, I don't know in response to some of your questions. To me, iambic pentameter sounds like something out of the Knights of the Round Table stories. And Arthur decreed that Uther Pendragon should lead the quest with iambic pentameter at his side, Lancelot being occupied with the ladies-in-waiting. <clears throat> you might also ask, how did a New Jersey businessman arrive before an audience of students and faculty some 35 miles, I confess to knowing nothing about the metric system, west of the city of Toronto? One of your teachers heard me recite some of my favorite poems last October after a car rally at 2 a.m. in the morning after imbibing a dram or two of good Scots whiskey. So <laughs> we'll see how good her judgment is. I hope you enjoy yourselves today. Most of you have either read or heard of Alice Through the Looking Glass, the Alice in Wonderland uh, stories by Lewis Carroll. Carroll demonstrated what, to me, is a marvelous premise of poetry, that you don't need real words to write a poem. Jabberwocky. Twas brillig, and the slivy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borer groves, and the gnomy wraths outglade. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jib-jib bird, and shun the fuminaceous brandersnatch. He took his vocal sword in hand, long time the maximi foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffing through the turgy wood, and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vocal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O fadjus day, kaju, kajay, he chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, and the slivy toes, did gyre and gimbal in the wade. All mimsy were the borer grows, and the gnomy rats outglade. So you don't need real words to make a poem. Uh, sometimes Lewis Carroll took his time in getting to a punchline, as we shall see. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. 
The sea was wet as wet could be, the sands were dry as dry. You could not see a cloud because no cloud was in the sky. No birds were flying overhead, there were no birds to fly. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They wept like anything to see such quantities of sand, and if this were only cleared away, they said it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose the walrus said that they could get it clear? I doubt it, said the carpenter, and shed a bitter tear. Oh, oysters, come and walk with us, the walrus did beseech, a pleasant walk, a pleasant talk along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four. And thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to shore. The walrus and the carpenter walked on a mile or so, and then they rested on a rock, conveniently low. And all the little oysters stood and waited in a row. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. But wait a bit, the oysters cry, before we have our chat, for some of us are out of breath and all of us are fat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need, pepper and vinegar besides, are very good indeed. And if you're ready, oysters dear, we can begin to feed. But not on us, the oysters cry, turning a little blue. After such kindness, that would be a dismal thing to do. The night is fine, the walrus said. Do you admire the view? It's so kind of you to come, and you are very nice. The carpenter said nothing but cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf, I had to ask you twice. It seems a shame, the walrus said, to play them such a trick. After we brought them out so far and made them trot so quick, the carpenter said nothing but the butter spread too thick. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oyster, said the carpenter, you've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But the answer came there none. And this was scarcely odd, because they'd eaten every one. There is a, uh, in contemporary literature, there is the image, what I call the Poe image of a poet. Uh, malnourished, poor, weak, <coughs> sodden with drugs or alcohol, this type of thing. Well, Alfred Noyes spoiled that image of a poet. He was wealthy, came from a wealthy family, graduated from Oxford College, and wound up as a professor of Princeton University. I've always enjoyed the images that he conjures up and his descriptions in his poem, The Highwayman. Here, Noyes combines two of the poet's, actually three of the poet's favorite topics, adventure, love, and death. The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwaymen came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. He had a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of claret velvet, and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle, his boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard, and he tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess the landlord's daughter. 
plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn yard, a stable wicket creaked, where Tim, the ulster, listened. His face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like a moldy hay. But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, but I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet if they press me sharply and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups. He scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair in the casement. <clears throat> His face burnt like a brand as a black cascade of perfume came tumbling o'er his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight, oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight. And he tugged at the reins in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning. He did not come at noon. And out of a tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a red coat troop came marching, King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord. They drank his ale instead. But they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement with muskets at the side. There was death in every window and hell in one dark window. For Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. They had tied her up to attention with many a sniggling jest. They had bound a musket beside her with a barrel beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, and they kissed her. They heard the dead men say, look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. <coughs> They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, and now on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger at last was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood to attention with the barrel beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight blank and bare in the moonlight. And the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Trot, lot, trot, lot. Had they heard it, the horse, horse hoofs ringing clear. Trot, lot, trot, lot, in the distance. Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of highway, over the brow of the hill, the highwaymen came riding, riding, riding. The red coats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still, Trot lot in the frosty silence, trot lot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer, her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath, then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight and warned him with her death. He turned, he spurred him westward. He did not know who stood. Bowed with her head o'er the musket, drenched with her own red blood. Not until the dawn he heard it, and slowly blanched to hear how best the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with a right white road smoking behind him in his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs in the golden noon, wine red was his velvet coat. And they shot him down on the highway, down like a dog on the highway. And he lay in his blood on the highway with a bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, a highwayman comes riding up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard, and he taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black-eyed daughter, Bess the landlord's daughter. <clears throat>
pleating a dark red love knot into her long black hair. Rudyard Kipling <coughs> was the, uh, perhaps the most renowned poet of the 19th century. <coughs> he was poet laureate of England, he was a favorite of Queen Victoria, and he wrote about a number of uh, different topics. He was, I think, at his best when he was writing about things that he knew about. He spent a considerable time in India, uh, but he also uh, was able to write about fairly commonplace things. And in this next poem, Kipling, Kipling presents us with a classic love triangle. This is a man, the saga of a man, torn between his two loves. It's entitled, The Betrothed. Open the old cigar box and get me a Cuba stout, for things are running crosswise and Maggie and I are out. We quarreled about Havana's, we fought over a good cheroot, and I know she's exacting, and she says I'm a brute. Open the old cigar box, let me consider a space in the soft blue veil of the vapor, music on Maggie's face. Maggie is pretty to look at, Maggie's a loving lass, but the prettiest cheeks must wrinkle, the truest of loves must pass. But there's peace in a Panatella, there's calm in a Henry Clay, but the best cigar in an hour is finished and thrown away. Thrown away for another is perfect and ripe and brown, but I could not throw away Maggie for fear of the talk of the town. Maggie, my wife at 50, gray and dour and old, with never another Maggie to purchase for love or gold. And the light of days that have been the dark of the days that are, and love's torch stinking and stale like the butt of a dead cigar. The butt of a dead cigar you are bound to keep in your pocket, with never a new one to light, though it's charred and black to the socket. Open the old cigar box, <clears throat> let me consider a while. Here is a mild manila, there is a wifely smile. Which is the better portion, bondage bought with a ring or a harem of dusky beauties, 50 tied in a string? Counselors cunning and silent, comforters true and tried, with never a one of the 50 to sneer at a rival bride. Thought in the early morning, solace in time of woes, peace in the hush of the twilight, Bomb ere my eyelids close. This will the fifty give me, asking naught in return, with only a sati's passion to do their duty and burn. This will the fifty give me, when they are spent and dead. Five times other fifty shall be my servants instead. The furrows of far off Java, the isles of the Spanish main, when they hear my harem is empty, will send me my brides again. I will take no heed to the raiment, nor food for their mouths withal, as long as the gulls are nesting, so long as the showers fall. I will scent them with the best vanilla, with tea will I temper their hides, and the more and the Mormon shall envy who read of the tale of my brides. For Maggie has written a letter that gives me me choice between the wee little whimpering love and the great god nicotine. And I've been a servant of love for barely a twelfth month clear, but I've been a priest of Panatella's a matter of seven years. And the gloom of my bachelor days is flecked with the cheery light of stumps that I burn to friendship and pleasure and work and fight. And I turn my eyes to the future that Maggie and I must prove, but the only light on the marshes is the will of the wisp of love. Will it see me safe through my journey or leave me bogged in the mire? If a puff of tobacco can cloud it, shall I follow that fitful fire? Open the old cigar box, let me consider anew. Old friends, and who is Maggie that I should be abandoning you? A million surplus Maggies are willing to bear the yoke, and a woman is only a woman, but a good cigar is a smoke. Light me another Cuba, I hold to my first sworn vows. If Maggie will have no rival, I'll have no Maggie for spouse. <laughs> By the way, in a, <clears throat> in a poetry reading, we suspend all political beliefs about most things because what we're dealing with here 
is, in many cases, cultures and attitudes long past. So yes, Kipling wrote a sexist poem. There's no question about it. But still, I think it's fun and it's enjoyable. How many of you have read House of Pooh Corner or Winnie the Pooh or any of those books? Good. For those of you who haven't, I hope you enjoy it. For those of you who have, I hope my rendition and some of my uh, cadence on these poems doesn't offend your sense of childhood. Um, I grew up pronouncing Iori's name as Iori. I have a cousin who grew up pronouncing Iori's name as Eeyore. And at six, we got into a terrible fist fight. <laughs> I have never forgiven him. <clears throat> if Rabbit was bigger and fatter and stronger, or bigger than Tigger, if Tigger was smaller, then Tigger's bad habit of bouncing at Rabbit would matter no longer if rabbit were taller, a profundity of the ages. <laughs> the Pooh and Piglet are sitting on a fence. And I'm going to read a little bit of the intro to this because I enjoy it. <coughs> One day, when Pooh Bear had nothing else to do, he thought he would do something. So he went round to Piglet's house to see what Piglet was doing. It was still snowing as he stumbled, stumbled over the white forest track, and he expected to find Piglet warming his toes in front of his fire. But to his surprise, he saw that the door was open, and the more he looked inside, the more Piglet wasn't there. He's out, said Pooh sadly. That's what it is. He's not in. I shall have to go have a fast thinking walk by myself bother. But first he thought that he would knock very loudly just to make quite sure. And while he waited for Piglet not to answer, he jumped up and down to keep warm. And a hum came suddenly into his head, which seemed to him a good hum, such as is hummed, hopefully, to others. The more it snows, tiddly pum, the more it goes,